You're recording, Kayla? Yes. Cool. <clears throat> All right, welcome guys to, I believe, the 14th meeting of Carroll PMC's, or uh, Carroll College Pre-Medical Club. Um, today, we are going to host an interview with Dr. Colin McInnes, who's an ophthalmologist with subspecialties in glaucoma and cataract surgery, and a Carroll alum. He was a biology major, um, in addition to much more information about um, his career and the field of medicine. And so today's agenda is, as usual, some opening messages. Uh, we'll give our COVID-19 case report for the community. Um, we're going to show you guys uh, our club motto options. And I just realized I did not create a poll for you guys to be able to vote. So I will work on that. And towards the end of the- um, towards We can the do it in the chat. Vote. What'd you say, Michael? I was saying we can uh, include them in the chat. If oh, that's easier. a good idea. Okay, guys, so what we'll have you do is you can send in the chat, like private message it to us. That way you can remain anonymous. Um, just private message to the host, um, your choice once we get on the screen and we'll go with it like that. Um, as a reminder, this is the motto that's gonna be printed on our shirts and is also going to just remain the motto um, for Carol PMC for future generations. Then we'll get into the interview, which will be about 25, 30, maybe 35 minutes. And then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, we ask that you stay muted during the interview. And then at the end, um, you can unmute yourself and ask questions or provide questions in the chat. Uh, and you don't have to private message those questions. You could just uh, leave them open to anybody um, so that anybody can see. Then we'll do the club, club model reveal. So based off your votes, we'll showcase what is the model that's gonna be on our shirts speak uh, uh, to the topics of the next meeting, and then we'll have final closing remarks. Whoops. Okay, is the audio okay? Can you hear on my end? It was kind of breaking up just now. Okay, just double checking. All right, so um, as we start every meeting um, to inform, excite, empower, and involve each and every one of you guys, um, but two questions this semester introduced um, uh, are to keep in mind for the meetings are why I am, am I here and why should I care about this information? Um, questions, these are questions you should be able to answer during and after our meeting today. Um, we understand everyone's schedule is busy. Uh, so by our officials using um, the I double E I, um, like inform, excite, empower, involving each and every one of you guys and keep and the members keeping these questions in mind, we will have a successful meeting. So um, for the COVID-19 community update, um, since our last meeting, um, there's been an increase in total cases uh, compared to the recent weeks with numbers jumping from 94,460 to uh, 96,000. 678 in the state of Montana. Um, county numbers have currently decreased by 34 from our last meeting. Um, and total deaths, unfortunately, have increased in the state of Montana by 71, with two being reported for Lewis and Clark County. Um, and important information, um, as we mentioned last meeting and several other meetings, is to keep eye out, an eye out for the clinical opportunities that are available and the volunteer positions. Um, one that I stumbled across at work was that the Helena Food Chair are starting to implement new volunteer applications. So if that's something you're interested in, um, please reach out. So, yeah. All right, so this is the page we were talking about. So um, we have, I don't know how many, but we have quite a few amount of club mottos. Um, each has just a different vibe and a different feeling to it, um, different flow as well. And so really it's up to you guys, anybody who is here right now, including club officials and officers, um, you can vote by submitting in the chat to the host of this meeting, your choice. You could just write it down or whatever. And so during these next 30 seconds, if you wanna grab your phone, just take a quick picture of the page. Um, you can do so to just remember what all of these are before we move on to the interview. Um, and yeah, like I said, I mean, this is gonna go on our shirts and this is gonna be what represents the club for, um, for many years, hopefully, and so uh, it's a somewhat of a somewhat of a impactful decision, and so, but we'd like to always leave it up to all of you guys, and majority will rule in this case. 
Okay, I'm going to switch this over now. And by the way, Google poll link to vote is not one of the options, so please don't send that. Okay. And without further ado, we're going to welcome Dr. Colin McKinnis. Thank you for your time here today, and uh, we look forward to hearing more about you. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks. So I grew up in Bozeman. I graduated from Carroll, oh gosh, back 10 years ago now. Hardly seems that long, but uh, class of 2011, uh, I'm back in private practice. Uh, practice ophthalmology in Bozeman at Medical Eye Specialists. And so you guys have kind of outlined a few things. You can go to the next slide. You'd have outlined a few things on the slide for me to just kind of touch on. Uh, feel free to interrupt um, whenever really I have no kind of uh, agenda to this. Uh, like I said, I grew up in Bozeman, just down the road there from Helena, about 90 miles, so didn't venture too far away from college. Uh, yeah, in high school in Bozeman, honestly, medicine wasn't on my radar. Um, it's like probably a lot of you, high school's about having fun and meeting people and growing up a little bit um, before college. So I would say, you know, I don't, maybe I shadowed someone in high school just trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, both my parents were docs. I mean, that was certainly kind of my introduction to medicine, but um, yeah, it wasn't, uh, wasn't really on my radar too much going to college. And so, yeah, in terms of what I thought would keep me from pursuing a career in medicine, again, wasn't really on my mind uh, too much at this point. Um, I ended up you can go to the next slide. Deciding to go to, to Carroll, I had some cousins there at the time and had visited a few times and really enjoyed it. Um, you know, to me, Carroll was a, a big positive experience in my life. Had a really great four years there. It's, I guess, where I decided ultimately to pursue medicine, but I think really college is a lot less about that and just growing as a person, making friends and, you know, kind of just kind of coming into your own as, a, as an 18 to, to 22 year old. So like I said, I had a, a lot of positives in my four years at Carroll. We lived in this house that some of you might recognize, a bunch of us uh, just down the street there from campus, this big old uh, rock house the last couple of years and, and had a lot of fun. Um, most of the people sitting on that roof are in medicine in some capacity. There's a psychiatrist and a general surgeon and a interventional radiologist and a hospitalist and so yeah we lived together in this big house and a bunch of us just kind of ended up um, wanting to do the same thing with our lives I didn't have any jobs uh, in college uh, at least during the school year um, yeah kind of went to went to school and and uh, had a good time I had a lot of good classes at Carroll. I'm sure a lot of my professors are, I know a lot of them are still there and they were big influences uh, on my life and, and on me at the time. Um, but yeah, the biochemistry with Dr. Gretsch and comparative anatomy with Dr. Hokett. I don't know if he still teaches that, but that was an awesome class. And that was actually a huge help going into medical school. So towards, yeah, I guess kind of going into my senior year, I decided to uh, apply to med school. I think I'd shadowed a few more people by then. I ended up having this summer job um, at an ER in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho that I just kind of happened into after my junior year of college, and I ended up really enjoying that. And that was kind of my first big introduction to medicine, actually kind of working um, the life. I was a CNA in, in an ER there for a summer. I ended up taking the MCAT that summer between my junior and senior year, I think I, yeah, I think I took it like in early June. So just kind of finished in May and then just kind of buckled down for a few weeks and um, yeah, did, did kind of the last minute cram thing and, and it went all right. Um, enough to decide to apply to med school that, that fall, I guess it was. So um, yeah, ended up applying to, oh, I don't know, maybe, 10, 15 schools, and over the course of the year, not till the spring that I actually got into medical school, but ended up getting into a couple schools by um, March, April of my, my senior year, I 
got into Georgetown uh, Medical School and um, ended up getting into the University of Washington as well and ultimately decided to, to go there. Um, in terms of advice about interviews, you know, it's, it's all about being yourself. They want to, you know, talk to someone that is genuine and kind of has their head and their heart in the right place. And so, you know, I, I don't think it's a big hurdle in terms of, um, you know, trying to say the right stuff. But I think what is, what is tougher is, you know, just being yourself um, the whole day. Um, but it's a lot of fun. You got to, you know, do a little traveling and um, see a few different places of the country that I really, really hadn't before as a, as a 22 year old and, and meet a lot of people. So uh, you can go to the next slide. So like I said, I ended up uh, going to the University of Washington in Seattle um, through the Whammy program. So at that time, I um, moved back to Bozeman and actually ended up getting into med school with um, three of my really good buddies from Carroll. And we all lived together in Bozeman and we went to school there for, for nine months at MSU. I think it's a different curriculum now. I think it's like 16 months uh, at MSU. And then you kind of go into the clinical rotation side of things. At that time, it was nine months of basic sciences. So it was kind of, you know, cell, cell bio on steroids and all coming at you in a couple months and uh, anatomy all year long. And so that was nine months in, at MSU and then uh, moved to Seattle for the second year. And that's where everyone in Idaho and Wyoming and Eastern Washington and Alaska, then everyone came together there for the final three years. Uh, which which was a lot of fun is class size about 215 um it was at least in the beginning and and even kind of all along pretty similar to carol at least kind of through the basic science years not a you know your medical school class isn't huge you know, to me you know for a lot of people the their med school class was a lot smaller than their college class and to, and to me is about the same even that first year in bozeman with 20 people at the time i think it's 30 now but you get to know these people really well and um, you know, you're kind of nose to the grindstone with them and, and have a good time when you're not studying. And so I think Carol, you know, kind of really prepared me well, at least for the first couple of years. I didn't find a lot of it um, conceptually all that challenging, but the volume is, is just kind of overwhelming at times. So it's, it's just uh, a whole lot of um, memorization for better or for worse. And, uh, the tests never stop actually. I'm in my thirties now and, and they're now just finally kind of letting up. So a whole lot more of that the first couple of years of med school. And then as you know, the last couple of years you get into the kind of clinical side of things. You do six and 12 week rotations and kind of touch on all aspects of medicine, internal medicine, family medicine, pediatrics, well, kind of the, the core um, principles. So, I mean, those third and fourth year were challenging in that uh, for kind of the first time in your life, you don't have much of a say in, in kind of your schedule, you know, the first few years are busy, but you can study when you want to. Um, but yeah, for the first time, you know, for someone like me who'd gone straight from college to med school, you're suddenly, um, you know, not really kind of dictating your own time. You're told to you know, show up at 5 a.m. to, to pre-round on these patients and you get to go home when the residents uh, and chiefs say you get to go home. And so, you know, it's, it's, a different um, side of things. It's very, uh, very structured and kind of who's in charge and who's next in charge. And obviously, as a med student, you're at the bottom of that totem pool, which I think is is good for kind of learning how to grow and adapt and uh, kind of handle whatever ends up getting thrown at you. You can go to the next slide. So towards oh, is like the beginning of my fourth year of med school or kind of just to the beginning, I actually thought I was going into orthopedic surgery for a while, or at least I strongly uh, considered it and ended up doing a rotation kind of randomly in ophthalmology for a couple of weeks. And I really enjoyed it. Uh, I liked the surgery of it. And I liked the kind of balance that it had with your time in clinic and your time in surgery and, and how patients recovered from those surgeries. Generally, the recovery is outpatients, you know, you're being able to follow them in clinic and, and you don't kind of live in the hospital, which is nice. Um, surgeries are really neat and a lot of them are very successful. 
um, and people really value their vision and their eyes. So overall, I thought it was a pretty rewarding thing, at least my whole two weeks of you know, kind of experience um, doing it as a early fourth year, late third year med student. So I decided to apply into ophthalmology and ended up matching at the University of Arizona down in Tucson. Um, as you can see here, beautiful city. So I was down there for, for four years. Uh, ophthalmology, you do a year of kind of general medical surgical training. So I was a transitional intern. Uh, they call it for a year down there and you do kind of exactly what it sounds like, a mix of, of medicine and surgery, um, you know, in the hospital six days a week and, and uh, you know, 26 days a month and, and it's busy. And then after that year, kind of doing a little bit of everything, um, a little ophthalmology here and there, you kind of become a full-time ophthalmology resident finally. So that is um, the last three years and uh, really enjoyed my time in Tucson. In terms of work-life balance, I'd say in general, as a resident, you don't have a ton of that. Um, ophthalmology is probably on the better end of that spectrum. And like I said, a lot of the things are managed in clinic rather than a hospital setting. So you can get away from, you know, kind of the, the long hours in the hospital. That being said, um, when I was a resident, we were in a call rotation where you're the person on call for a million or two people. Um, in, in my case, in Tucson, um, parts of Northern Mexico, they ended up showing up to the ERs you covered. Um, Western New Mexico and Eastern California. So, so you're really busy on calling. And you got used to, you know, as a med student, there was some short, short nights, early mornings, but there still wasn't a ton of total responsibility. So that's what residency is all about is kind of learning the tricks of your trade and in learning kind of to be the, um, the, the person with, with kind of, if not the final say, you know, because you have always attendings and, and other residents potentially backing you up, but you know, you're doing a lot on your own for the first time in the middle of the night. So it's, uh, it's busy, um, but, you know, still had a good time. Outlets still like to enjoy getting outside. Um, my wife and I did. We really enjoyed Tucson. And again, in, in ophthalmology, it's a relatively kind of small residency programs by and large across the country. They're anywhere from two to two to nine people per year. And you're kind of with them all day, every day. Um, so there's four of us in Tucson. You get to know these people really well. And in, in that sense, it was, um, you know, a lot of fun to, to, you know, kind of meet some of these lifelong friends. You can go to the next slide. So we talked about a little bit about what the training looks like to become an ophthalmologist. Um, it's four years. And then after that, you can go into kind of general practice or actually break the eye into many smaller subspecialties, if you can believe it. So I ended up doing a, another year of fellowship training, which I'd say probably the slight majority of uh, ophthalmology uh, trainees end up pursuing fellowships. So I did a year of glaucoma and in more cataract surgery training at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. So I was there for a year. Um, the most common surgery I do is cataract surgery. I do um, many of these every week. It's one of the most common surgeries in the United States. It's right up there with uh, C-sections. Uh, everyone gets cataracts by and large at some point in their life. So everyone by and large needs cataract surgery. It's a, it's a really rewarding surgery. I don't know if um, people want to take a look at this link later. It's not, uh, I can get a video of me operating to upload, but this is a good um, video of, of kind of a, a typical cataract surgery. So you get a little sense of kind of the scale of things um, that we work on in the eye or we use little incisions that are just over two millimeters and we remove the, the cloudy lens inside the eye with a special ultrasound machine that breaks it up and, and you vacuum it out and uh, if you watch this link, the, the guy makes it look uh, easy, which is one of the things I really like about cataract surgery. Uh, it's, it's very technical. Um, there's a, a steep learning curve. You do hundreds before, you know, you, you really feel um, proficient, but uh, eventually you kind of you know, start to really uh, hone your craft and, and you can help people in a kind of relatively short amount of time with a, a really uh, effective uh, surgery. So it's one of the things I really like about being an ophthalmologist, one of the reasons I'm, I'm in the field. 
I also do glaucoma surgery. So glaucoma is damage to the optic nerve that connects the eye to the brain. And one of the big risk factors for that damage is elevated eye pressure. So in general, our, our treatments in glaucoma are targeted at lowering the pressure. We do that with prescribing people eye drops to use chronically. We have uh, different lasers that we use in the office to treat the drainage system of the eye to help lower the pressure. And then ultimately there's glaucoma surgery. So that's making a, uh, an incision outside the eye and a little trapdoor flap to the inside of the eye to let out pressure, uh, putting a, a kind of a plastic silicone tube shunt uh, from the inside of the eye to the outside to move fluid. Um, again, ultimately the goal is kind of lowering pressure in those people to try and save their vision. So that's kind of the mix of surgery that I do in general. I am in clinic about four days a week and I operate about one day a week. What made me decide to become an ophthalmologist over an optometrist? So um, optometrists um, are medical doctors. So I guess that decision for me was kind of made when I decided to apply to med school, um, kind of at the end of college optometrists. Um, know a ton about eyes and they um, diagnose people with eye conditions that refer things to, to ophthalmologists for kind of um, uh, care and surgical care. They fit people with contacts and prescribe glasses. Um, I think it's a, it's a really neat field. It's a shorter field in terms of kind of how long the ultimate training is. So it's just four more years in general after um, college rather than kind of the eight to nine um, for ophthalmology. They don't do eye surgery. Um, so that kind of translates to, you know, they have a, in general, I think a pretty nice lifestyle, um, you know, a little more eight to five in general, they're not responsible for, for medical emergencies and taking call at ERs. And so there's less kind of urgent surgical stuff. Um, and again, just um, they don't do surgery in general. So that's kind of the big distinction there. Um, like I said, I didn't really decide to on ophthalmology versus kind of all the other fields in medicine kind of towards the end of, towards the end of med school. I knew I, I thought I wanted to be a surgeon uh, of some sort. And yeah, like I said, I just kind of um, ended up kind of seeing the light um, in ophthalmology. So in terms of kind of choosing a specialty in your guys' shoes, it's much too early to figure or to even think about that at this point. Um, it's something that people stress about all through med school, rightly so. I mean, there's not a lot of time um, kind of once you're at that point to decide what you want to do for the rest of your life, but um, you can always take extra time in med school. I have several friends who ended up doing five years instead of four because they weren't exactly sure and wanted to check things out more. So. Uh, it's it's worth taking that extra time before you you know you kind of commit years more of training and um, the rest of your career to doing it. But that being said, um, you know in college if you like something that's great. I'd say there's very few people I knew who started med school knowing what they wanted to do who actually ended up doing that. So um, not something you're going to put a lot of thought in. Just uh, enjoying college and, and kind of making friends and, and enjoying the relationships and enjoying your time in college is, is what's important at this point. So my daily routine, um, mostly, you know, clinic eight to five ish, four days a week. I share call with my partners um, at the local hospitals and kind of cover uh, a good swath of Southwest Montana for, for eye emergency type stuff. And so um, I do, we, we share that kind of between um, the six of us. And like I said, I operate about uh, one day a week or so. And I think that's it for kind of my slides. If anyone has any questions. All right. So yeah, um, Kayla, can you check to see if anyone has posted any questions on the chat? There is no questions in the chat as of yet. All right. Um, while we figure that out, I can um, play that video from earlier, I think. Um, I don't know if I need to. I'm probably going to have to stop sharing. All right. So I'll play that video for now. All right. Okay. 
Also, if you have not voted yet, please do so. I'm about to tally up the results. Okay, I'm going to share my screen again. And we'll watch a little bit of this, uh, of the video. And I'm assuming that we can hear over the video. So by any means, Dr. McKinnis, if you want to make any comments. Um, yeah, you, there's probably some introduction. You can jump ahead, probably 20 seconds or 30 seconds if you want. All right. Rosis. And so it's a significant cataract. This patient also has against the rule astigmatism. So steep meridian is right where we're making that incision, which is temporal. So that's a little two millimeter blade I was talking about. And this is all done under an operating microscope. So big fancy um, head like microscope that you're, that you're sitting at. I don't think that a smaller capsulorexis has any benefits. And in fact, it may have some downsides. And open up the front, um, the front of the cataract. So the cataract is, is kind of like an M&M &M where you kind of have to peel off the outer layer to make this kind of window-like opening in the front. Remember, you're and you're gonna incision and the rectus. break up and remove the, the cloudy lens, which is contained within that. Them. Beautiful, and that looks great. Nicely centered over those Purkinje images as well. It's a little hydro dissection. This is a very important step. You've heard me say before, if it does not spin, you will not win. So definitely want to have some good hydro dissection so we can spin this nucleus. And there it is, good spinning. I like to recoat the central endothelium with our dispersive viscoelastic, just a little aliquot in the center. Very important for me that the patients have excellent vision on post-op day one. I want to keep that cornea clear. I like a phaco chop technique. So high vacuum, high flow, buzzing in with the phaco probe. There's the chopper and the nucleus can be split. Now we'll spend some time there making sure we fully split it and then bring out the first hemi-nucleus. I can chop the nucleus into smaller pieces as well. But with a patient like this, with a really relatively modest amount of nucleus approach, it's very easy to just emulsify an entire hemi-nucleus without further subchopping. So just the one initial chop is typically enough. And then we're also using a high flow, about 40 to 50 cc's a minute. So we get the pieces of lens material to flow to the tip very naturally and efficiently. I'm very light on the phaco foot pedal. I want to minimize the total amount of energy I put in the eye in terms of ultrasound. I also want to minimize the fluid that goes through the eye as well. That's going to help keep the corneas clear I wonder, Dr. McInnes, if you want to certify, just to make sure we're all on the same page, what exactly cataracts are. Oh, you're muted. So we're all born with a lens inside of our eye. And just with time, those, uh, the inside of that lens, the cells continue to um, proliferate kind of throughout life. So slowly with time, uh, it gets cloudy with age. And it's accelerated by, you know, different systemic diseases, steroid use, high blood sugars, diabetes, uh, UV exposure, but even kind of the healthiest living, uh, someone will get a cloudiness to that lens with time. And so that, when that obscures and affects your vision, that's when you're, you're ready for cataract surgery. So what the goal of surgery is, is to remove this cloudy lens and leave its support structure in place, this really delicate support structure. That's on the order of just a couple microns uh, thick on the backside. And that's what holds this new clear plastic lens implant, which you'll see uh, this guy putting in here shortly. It's based on the dimensions of the eyes. You can build in you know, what you'd like of the glasses prescription at the time of cataract surgery, which is really kind of a nice uh, side effect of surgery. Someone who's very nearsighted, has been in glasses their whole life, you can build in um, most of their glasses prescription with this lens implant. So at this point in the video, he's removed the cloudy lens and you might make out kind of those little kind of very fine lines. That's that support structure that's still in place. And that's going to hold this new clear plastic lens. So uh, this optic goes in folded up um, it's acrylic and then it unfolds it has these little arms that kind of unfold and with time will scar into place and that that lens um, becomes fixed inside the eye it's going to make it very easy for me to get the eye it's a great surgery in general um, doesn't take it 
a really long time. A lot of times the next day patients are already seeing better. Um, actually they have a couple of days of some scratchy discomfort um, and they will use some drops afterwards to treat the inflammation and the swelling that you stir up with getting that cloudy lens out. Um, but in general, you know, in the next couple of days, they're going to be seeing a lot better. So it's, a, it's a really neat surgery in that regard. What is a patient in this situation? Are they sedated? Are they completely knocked out? Or are they yeah. completely conscious and you're just offering words of calm to them? Yeah, good question. So the vast, vast majority of the patients I do are uh, awake for surgery. They have a, an IV. They get some relaxing medication. There's usually an anesthesiologist there. Um, hanging out, but they're awake, so they don't have a, a tube down their throat to, to breathe for them. They're a little sedated, but not to the point where they're kind of disinhibited and trying to look around or, or help you out. So obviously staying still is a big deal, but uh, rarely I'd say one time out of a hundred, you know, you have to put the patient to sleep for different reasons. Sometimes you have to do a numbing shot behind the eye to kind of paralyze the eye temporarily. So it doesn't move around on you, but most of the time, yep, you're awake, but relaxed and just lying flat on your back looking at a bright light. That's hard to believe because that honestly looks terrifying to me being in that situation. Also, I should have probably mentioned viewer discretion advised before I played that. That was the first video we've had a doctor um, comment on and that's actually, it was actually really cool. Yeah, so I they're, hope they're not too bloody usually. Dinner. They're not yeah. too bloody usually, so. Uh... Right, okay. I'm going to open it up again. Any other questions? Does anyone have any other questions for Dr. Uh, Dr. McKinnis? I, of course, have a few, but um, I could always, always, let's open up the floor. So if anybody, you can unmute yourself. You can post in the chat, whatever, whatever you'd like. Um, Dr. McKinnis, I had a question um, in relation to research and technology for your field. Um, mm -hmm. In my time a couple of years back in Guatemala, I utilized an app that was made um, by Brian Shaw in Baylor. Um, and what the app was, was a white eye detector for retinoblastoma. And I was curious if you could comment on the efficacy of such technologies. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's tons of different um, there's, there's a lot of technology basically in ophthalmology is one of the reasons I enjoyed the field and it's technology that's always involving, always evolving, always changing uh, because it's such a, a, a visual field and, and so image heavy. Um, things like you mentioned, there's, there's a ton of things out there to, you know, trying to pick up on these things um, visually that, you know, we might not miss or an untrained eye might not see. So yeah, there's, there's a, a lot of there's a big role for that type of stuff and it's always growing. Great, thank you. Okay, any other, any other questions? I have a question I'll ask. Yeah. So what exactly are all of those different like tests at the eye doctor, like the one where you like hit a button if you like see something fuzzy or um the like air balloon one or all of those like the computerized ones yeah so there's uh, a million different machines in an ophthalmology clinic um some of those things you're describing might be things to check your eye pressure when you come in um, the one with all the dials on it or someone's asking you what's better one or two that's called a four opter that's um one of the ways that you can uh, check a glasses prescription there's, we have different scanners that, that look at the back of the eye and the optic nerve and they measure the different tissue layers and measure the thickness and they're really detailed and accurate They're on the order of microns. So yeah, different cool cameras and, and imaging things. There's different lasers, there's automated visual fields that map out your peripheral vision for things like glaucoma. Um, it's, it's kind of an asymptomatic thing in a lot of cases and so you need this kind of specialized machine to, to map out what you do and don't see in your peripheral vision. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm curious because um, 
the, the distinction between optometrists and ophthalmology was quite interesting. Uh, I found it quite interesting. I'm curious if like, if what I got from it was correct. And so an optometrist is almost more so like a physician in the sense that you wouldn't tend to see an optometrist in, in, in maybe a hospital. Maybe they're doing like the elaborative aspect of medicine, whereas an ophthalmologist is like a surgeon is like the one who is yeah like is that correct or is that something yeah so i mean basically the distinction is an optometrist goes to to optometry school so it's four years of kind of learning um more learning just focused on the eye um and and eye diseases and ultimately after that they um treat and diagnose eye diseases they prescribe glasses contacts um yeah, not in a hospital setting, you know, an outpatient um, clinic setting, and yeah, they don't don't do eye surgery. So, ophthalmologists, um, you know, we all go to med school together. Um, like I was saying, a picture of a bunch of us back in college sitting on that roof. Um, you know, one's a psychiatrist and one's a radiologist, and um, one's one does hospital medicine. Um, but the, our four years of medical school are all the same, so we all. You know, you'll do a couple years of basic sciences and then you do some of, of kind of everything else. And so, you know, we're all medical doctors. And then at the end of that is kind of where we, um, you know, kind of go our different ways with kind of residency specialty training. And then, yeah, but like, like you said, you know, op- ophthalmologists, um, yeah, do eye surgery and are, are medical doctors and are just kind of more in that um, kind of side of medicine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That, I see what you mean. Um, and one more question, uh, specifically about the housing situation. That's, that's quite unique thing to hear, <laughs> hear about. I've actually run by that house multiple times here. So it's very funny that you guys used to live there. Uh, in addition, I'm just curious, living with eight or nine other pre-meds. I mean, I live with one pre-med and sometimes I want to lose, I feel like I'm losing my mind sometimes. Uh, so I can only imagine living with like, like eight other pre-meds. Was it a very, we push collaboration here at Carroll PMC. Like we want to work together and build each other up towards that lofty goal mm-hmm. of being a doctor. Did, was it ever like cutthroat? Like, were you guys like, oh, you got like that grade in a class or like I got that one point higher on the MCAT or how was the atmosphere in that building? No, um, yeah, no, not at all. I mean, I don't, I don't think any of us kind of really considered ourselves pre-med. A bunch of us, you know, not everyone who lived there. Um, the smart ones that, that lived there ended up uh, going into business or computer science, um, but um, some of us weren't so smart and uh, ended up in medicine. Uh, but no, it was not. Uh, it wasn't like that at all. We we're, we're just good friends. Um, I would recommend if eight or nine people are going to live in, in a house to have more than one shower. Um, that was an ideal because, um, yeah, we all that was the one thing about a lot of us being in the same biology classes is we all had that same class starting at, at 8 a.m. So uh, that wasn't ideal. But other than that, no, it was a, it was a good environment. Nice. Good to hear. Okay. Does anyone else have any other, any other questions for Dr. McInnes? Any other ones? Um, I, I am kind of curious as well for some of the people who took extra time you knew of in medical school, just kind of what that looks like. Like, can, can you just say, hey, I need another year for this? Or Yeah, you- most of them, you know, everyone kind of gets through usually the basic science, um, two years or year and a half, um, whatever it is now. It's more kind of when you're in your clinical years, usually after your third year, um, where it's kind of time to start applying for something and you know you want to do your research to you know to learn more about what you're applying into or to strengthen your application for um you know whatever you want to do um but at least where i went to med school it was uh, it was pretty wide open you know you just had to i mean you had to have that conversation with yourself and you know accept the opportunity cost of kind of delaying everything a year but um, other than that yeah it's wasn't a big hurdle as far as I know. All right. And so if anyone else has, doesn't have any other questions and speak, speak now if you, if you don't. Um, oh, wait. Okay, I have one question. Um, 
for your field, I guess, I mean, you might get this from patients a lot, but um, for, I guess, pre-meds and such studying and everything, a lot of screen time is in play. What is the best way or what is the best recommendation to monitor our own eye health? Um, yeah, honestly, I don't, I don't think like screen time is, I mean, screen time, visually intensive things, you don't blink as much. Um, you know, your eyes can get dry, use artificial tears if they feel dry, but in terms of, you know, the blue blockers and all that, um, you know, I'm not a big proponent uh, of that type of stuff, so I, I wouldn't uh, worry about that at all, but yeah, uh, not something I had to think about back in college. Everything was, everything was on paper, and uh, Zoom wasn't a thing, so, so I don't know. I haven't, I haven't thought about that. Yeah, everything is um, electronics now, Dr. McInnes. It's all, well, I mean, there's some in-person classes. I guess that's that's too far a stretch, but a lot of it's online now too. And so, yeah, yeah I, I don't think I'm alone in that my eyes are pretty pretty dry and, and red and irritated by the end of the day as well. But um, it's good that we have providers like you here who can help us in the instances in which our, 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 eyes, um, our eyes suffer. Does anyone have any other final questions for Dr. McInnes? at all because if so i'm going to open up the floor for you dr mckinnis to just say one any last word of motivation think back to when you were the pre-med carol kid struggling what did you what do you think you needed to hear in that moment yeah i mean i would just say again you know enjoy your time in college That's, those are you know some of the best years of your life and you meet a lot of lifelong friends and um you know look towards the future a little bit um as you guys already obviously all are by by logging into this call but um don't stress out too much about college or that last organic chemistry test um because yeah it's um it's not the end of the world well said okay all right well thank you so much for your time we really appreciate it um we are going to we're going to pose our our club model and then close yeah, up that's good to log out if you'd like get some shut eye before the next day pun intended shut eye and uh we really appreciate your time thank you appreciate it thanks thank you thanks for having me all right guys i'm going to reshare my screen wow that's a lot of powerpoints okay um here we go okay i believe we left off right here perfect okay so club on a reveal oh kayla you already inputted it awesome <laughs> Yeah, this is what, no, that's perfect. So this is what we we decided upon. So learning to do, doing to serve, serving to make a difference. That's great. Um, I think that's going to look great on a shirt. And then tomorrow I'm going straight to the Saints shop and I am, um, we're putting the order in. So we're expecting the shirts to be here maybe in a week or two. I don't know, depending on the roads now, God knows what's going to happen. Um, negative 20 degree temperatures or, or below tend to make travel quite difficult. So we'll see what happens, but we will keep you guys updated as far as um, how that goes. Thank you for the, per the person who recommended this quote um, or this motto. I think this is great. And it's a good symbol of what we want to do at Carroll PMC uh, and what we want to do in the future as well. So that's awesome. All right. And, oh, that's blank slide. What was that supposed to be? Sorry. <laughs> I was originally going to put it on that slide, but then I didn't. <laughs> that's okay. Okay. Um, is there a slide for the, um, oh, wow. That's cool. Is there a slide for the next meeting? Because we usually do that before the closing message. Um, no. That's there's not. Slide. There's not. So use the blank one and just talk. Okay. All right. Okay. Great. So our next meeting, <clears throat> we're thinking of doing something a little bit more hands-on. So this is going to be a meeting that We'll Zoom initially just to say like our, our welcome messages and we'll uh, speak to the, the next meeting as well. Uh, but we really recommend you guys to be in person for the meeting. For those who are not with us this evening, we'll send an email to clarify that on Monday. Uh, what we wanna do is we're going to do these hands-on approaches to some of the clinical jobs that we have currently. So we're going to have a patient service technician section uh, and a CNA section in which some things like assessments and some uh, other details about the job in particular are going to be gone over. And you'll actually be able to do some of those assessments on each other um, 
And then on the other side of things, we are also going to have an EMT inscribing station, uh, which is going to focus more so on the pre-hospital aspects of patient care. Uh, I'm going to run it along with Joey, and we're going to do an overview of just kind of the job and what things look like. And then we'll, uh, we're going to get hands on with some with a critical patient scenario and see how you guys act uh, when, when under pressure. And so uh, it should be quite interesting. So we're really, what we're trying to do with this is we're trying to differentiate or show you guys the differences between the pre-hospital setting and on the brink of the pre-hospital setting, AKA the ER and more of the medical floor in definitive care um, and quite more stable usually, hopefully. Um, so that's our idea for the next meeting. More details will come about specifically what we'll be doing. Uh, and we really encourage you and your friends to come um, and witness and experience it for yourself. Have you ever wondered what an, being an EMT is like or a scribe or a patient care tech or a CNA? Maybe this will give you some insight before you ultimately make that decision and apply for those jobs or continue those jobs. And with that, our parting message Yeah, you can hit twice more. Another one. And then one more. Okay, <laughs> so our parting message is by Albert Einstein. You never fail until you stop trying. Very good. All right. Well, have a great weekend, you guys. Sanitize your laptops. We really appreciate your attendance today. I hope you guys got some insight out of that. We hope to see you guys in person next week. Speak to other members. Speak to your friends. Come along. Um, we, we're going to have a pretty special meeting plan. So take care. Be safe. Stay warm. We'll see you guys next week. Thank you. Okay. Cool. Okay. I think only officials are, are left. Oh, hang on, let me stop the recording.